No mai haere mai. Welcome to this digital presentation of the Margaret Mahi Lecture. I'm Christine Youngs, Chair of Storylines Children's Literature Charitable Trust, Te Whare Waituhi Tamariki o Aotearoa. And I'd like to welcome you all to the 2020 Storylines Margaret Mahi Lecture presentation. I'd especially like to welcome Maria Gill, 2020 winner of the Storylines Margaret Mahi Medal, who we'll hear from shortly. This medal is New Zealand's most prestigious honour for children's authors, illustrators, and publishers. Storylines presents its annually to acknowledge lifetime achievement and significant contribution to the broad field of children's literature and literacy. It was first presented in 1991 to Margaret Mahi in recognition of her contribution to the world of literature for children and young adults. Her inaugural lecture set the standard for those given by subsequent award winners. These published lectures by the champions of the New Zealand children's literature community have enriched New Zealand's literary heritage with their insight into the experiences, ideas, and issues involved in writing for or illustrating for children and young adults, improving literacy, and or ensuring access to quality literature. Having had a sneak preview of Maria's lecture, I can promise that her presentation will be no exception. Maria, welcome to this first ever pre online presentation of the lecture, and thank you for presenting this way. Please accept our congratulations on winning the award and our regrets that we can't present your medal to you in person. We greatly admire and appreciate the contribution you have made to the nonfiction genre in particular, and your ongoing support for and encouragement of your fellow writers. We look forward to your lecture and the insights I know you will offer. Thank you so much, and over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today with you to uh, give you my Margaret Mahi medal presentation. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Wula talofa whakalofa lahi atu ki a rāna mālo e ne le e. And you might be looking at me and wondering, why am I wearing this outfit? This outfit came about when the Scholastic team Illustrator Marco Vanchik and I were thinking of ideas for the front cover of a book we were working on. Marco drew a rough of how he thought the character should stand, but it wasn't quite the posture we were looking for. So I threw on a long skirt and asked my husband to take a photo of me holding a pen in my hand. Penny Scowan thought of the same idea and she took a photo of her holding a pen in their hand as well. And this helped Marco draw the, the front cover of the book. And it also gave me an idea to dress like uh, the main character at the book launch. And my good friend Mary Kelleher made the outfit, and here is Penny Scowan and myself at the book launch of, you've probably guessed it, Kate Shepherd. And the reason why I've worn it today is to show you the lengths I go to to make my stories real for children. I'm not the only author who does. Fifi Colston, Gareth Ward also dress up in their steampunk costumes, and there are others who also do it. I write non-fiction books about historical events, famous people, and our wildlife in a creative way. Part of that is bringing it alive, whether it's dressing the part or getting kids to act it out with me or using props. And you might see a few of them up the top there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'd like to first thank you all for tuning in today. There are people who've been there throughout, with me throughout my writing career that I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, my critique group, Lorraine Norman, Chris Gurney, and Heather Arnold. And I'm also here um, also because of a lot of uh, writers who have been very supportive, especially Fifi Colston and Melinda Shamanic. Then there's all the wonderful Kiwi Write for Kids authors and Yak Book, who I've been associated with over the last 18 years. I feel really supported by this awesome group of writers and illustrators. Also, thanks to all the publishers who publish our New Zealand stories. I especially want to mention Lynette Evans and Penny Scowan from Scholastic. They produce beautiful books, and I'm really proud to be published with them, as well as New Holland, Penguin, Reed in its day, Pardon and Burton, and lots of educational publishing houses. I'd also like to thank my family, my husband Rod, my son Tristan, and my daughter Rhiannon, and my mother and father. They've listened to many drafts of stories with patience. One organisation who has been very supportive to New Zealand children's writers and illustrators is Storylines. And I want to thank them for honouring authors and illustrator, illustrators with these awards and medals that they give out every year. Congratulations to all the winners and those whose books were selected as notable books. 
I also want to give thanks to a very special lady and her family. I interviewed her for my book, New Zealand Hall of Fame, many years ago. People told me I should include Catherine Mansfield or Janet Frame, and I said, no, I'm going to include an author that all children will know. And when I'm in schools, I encourage children to guess who it is. I give them a few clues. She's a New Zealander. She started making up poetry when she was three years onwards. She wrote stories about witches, pirates, and sharks. And they'll either say Joy Cowley, and she's also a very valid person, or Margaret Mayhe. But sometimes they'll say David Williams, and that's the world we live in, where overseas authors are more well known in New Zealand today, except Margaret and Joy, of course. Margaret was an inspiration to a lot of writers and readers. Her books, today's events, the Premium Book Award, and her medal keep her name living on. It is an honour to be here today to accept the Margaret Medal Award, Margaret Mayhe Medal Award. When Christine Young emailed me to say Storylines was awarding me the medal, at first I couldn't believe it. In fact, I wondered if I was in a time warp. I thought she was talking about the Margaret Mayhe Award I'd won at the 2016 New Zealand Book Awards for children and young adult. I reread the email twice. Then dumbfounded, I turned to Fifi Colston, who was with me. We were teaching reading and writing uh, illustration, writing and illustration works shops for Write Like an Author and Draw Like an Artist in Wellington. And we were on our lunch break. And I said, I think I've just won something. I read it out and Fifi jumped up and hugged me saying, you've just won the Margaret Mayhe medal. I don't think the reality settled in for quite a while afterward. When all the congratulations came in from the wonderful group of writers and illustrators, I did feel the imposter syndrome and I antagonized over the speech for quite a while. Lockdown intervened and to take a positive out of a negative, it gave me extra time to write the speech. What I've realized is it's especially an honor to be a representative for the nonfiction writers community. There's been only one other nonfiction author, Andrew Crow. He won it in 2008 and gave a speech about creative nonfiction books. Interestingly, that was the year I first came across creative nonfiction picture books. I'm going to take this opportunity today to talk about nonfiction, why I've written the types of nonfiction I have, and how I think they hook young readers in. I'll also talk about how, as a nonfiction author, I've tried to reach my audience in schools, libraries, and outside. I started my career writing expository nonfiction books. Because of my teaching background, I was always asking, how can I hook children in and keep them reading? I didn't want children to just read my books for research. I wanted to make the books entertaining as well. For example, in Save Our Seas, I used skipper L. B. Tross to take the reader on a voyage to different coastlines around New Zealand. Each page has a joke, some facts about sea creatures, and diag diagrams and illustrations to emphasize other information about these animals. Vivian Lidgard drew the illustrations. An earthquake shaking New Zealand, I asked Marco Ivanchik to draw the earthquake god and he talks directly to the reader. There's a timeline that displays the very first recorded earthquakes in New Zealand and around the world to, up to the publishing date of 2018. In running the country, I included biographies of many politicians who have governed the country, making sure that Māori and women were also in the book. And there are lots of other features to draw the young readers in. There have been many excellent nonfiction books using the same techniques. These books are very relevant today. They're used in the school curriculum for refugees wanting to learn about New Zealand culture and for kids who obsess about particular subjects. Grandparents, bless them, also buy them for their grandchildren. Research in America reveals that 42% of students would rather read expository nonfiction. 25% prefer narrative storytelling, and 33% of children enjoy both styles equally. Interestingly, the buyers of children's nonfiction, librarians, teachers, parents, prefer, native, prefer narrative stories, 56%, expository, 8%, and 36% prefer both. Well-known American writer Melissa Stewart 
says that expository loving info kids read with a purpose to soak up facts, ideas and information about topics they find fascinating. Whereas narrative nonfiction readers, nor, whereas nor, narrative nonfiction gives readers an intimate look at the world and people or animals being described in a storytelling format. The scenes often include expository bridges that provide background information. In Melissa's article, Teaching Nonfiction, What You Need to Know About the Differences Between Expository and Narrative Styles, she wrote that experts recommend a 50-50 mix of fiction and nonfiction, with two-thirds of the nonfiction having an expository writing style. Yet research shows that classroom collections only have 17 to 22 percent nonfiction overall, and only seven to nine percent expository nonfiction. I often ask children who loves nonfiction books, and the majority by far are boys. Boys often have a passion for science subjects such as volcanoes, war, dinosaurs. They like small fact boxes, a mix of text and illustrations displayed on the page, and that they can start the book anywhere. Dr. Bar Dr. Barbara Moss, a professor of literacy education at San Diego University said, early exposure to the language of nonfiction helps enhance children's understanding of exposition and may prevent the difficulties many students encounter with those texts later on. Moss also said there are no other genre of books that have changed as much as nonfiction. And I really noticed that over the last 18 years while I've been writing them. American educationalists changed the reading habits in schools, believing if teachers encourage children to read nonfiction early, they will be better prepared for high school onwards. And where 80% of what they will read, where they will 80% of what they will read and write will be nonfiction. It increases their background knowledge about subjects extends their vocabulary and helps them navigate more complex texts later on. I tell children that nonfiction books build up their kete of knowledge inside of them, teaching them how the world, even the universe works, and it helps them learn about different cultures and languages. Author Melinda Shamanic likens reading to giving us superpowers. We can transport to other, another country and into someone's life through the power of words and building of images in our mind. There is plenty of research about the power of reading books. It helps children put themselves into the shoes of others and grows their capacity for empathy. That's because when we read about a situation or feeling, it's like we're feeling it ourselves. Creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction, sometimes also called faction, is not concise facts told. Sorry, I'll start again. Creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction or faction, it has many titles, can do that. It's not concise facts told in a conversational tone like many expository books do. Instead, it's a story with a beginning, middle, and end. In Kate Shepard, we feel her angst when she fails with the first and second petitions. In Abel Tasman, we worry that they won't ever find the second ship again. In Icebreaker, we will, we will them to find land in Antarctica. Narrative nonfiction encourages more girls to read about New Zealand history, wildlife, and famous people, drawing them in with its storytelling powers. And that's the beauty of creative nonfiction. It combines the information side of nonfiction with the storytelling side of fiction. I discovered my first creative nonfiction story at university when I was doing a graduate, graduate diploma in journalism studies. I could see how the power of story could draw you into a non-fiction article. Several years later, I picked up the first creative non-fiction picture book in a school library. The book Home by Narelle Oliver blew me away. I realized right there and then that is what I wanted to write. Sadly, Narelle Oliver has since died of cancer. She wrote many stunning natural science books about Australians' wildlife. When I read her story about a falcon nesting on top of a sky rise building, I felt goosebumps all over. This was a way to hook those children who shy away from nonfiction books through story itself. Creative nonfiction books encompass, encompasses the best of fiction and nonfiction worlds. 
What do creative nonfiction books have in common? The books are visually appealing, featuring, featuring stunning illustrations. They are accurate and authoritative, often peer-reviewed by experts. The writing style is engaging, using literary techniques. With this in mind, I wrote my first creative nonfiction book, Rangatoto. I'll never forget the day when the commissioning editor said to me she'd take it, but she wasn't sure about the prose in the story. I sent her home and, she, and said it was a new style of writing where a true tale uses literary techniques. Luckily, she trusted me and we kept to the text I'd written, with a little bit of editing, of course. Heather Arnold poured her heart and soul into the acrylic, watercolour and sketched illustrations. I was so proud when the book was a finalist in the Book Awards. Many teachers have told me they use the book throughout the primary years, the story itself for young readers and the fact boxes for independent readers up to 12 years of age. I've written a few more creative nonfiction books since then. The Call of the Kokako, also with Heather Arnold, about saving the great ghosts of New Zealand. Tauroa's journey with Gavin Mouldy, the story of the 500th albatross to hatch in Dunedin, and his journey to South America and back. And my latest, Icebreaker, an epic Antarctic adventure with Alistair Hughes. The untold story of the New Zealand skipper, Frank Worsley, who helped save the endurance crew with Sir Ernest Shackleton in Antarctica when their ship became trapped in the ice. I wrote my first biographical book, New Zealand Hall of Fame with Bruce Potter, the children's choice winner in the nonfiction category in 2012. And the first book with Marco Ivanchik as illustrator, New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame, featuring New Zealand's top sports people. Marco Ivanchik and I collaborated on five books altogether. Abel Tasman, Mapping the Southern Hemisphere, the story of the Dutch explorer who put us on the European world map. Kate Shepherd Leading the Way for Women, one of the extraordinary women who helped New Zealand become the first country in the world to give all women the vote, including two biographical books, which have also a form of creative nonfiction. And in time for the World War commemorations, Anzac Heroes, the winner of the 2016 Margaret Mahey Book of the Year Prize, for featuring, featuring 30 Australian and New Zealand men and women who were on the front lines in World War I and, and World War II. Then Anzac Animals followed. It has stories about animals that befriended Australian and New Zealand soldiers during World War I and World War II. Creative nonfiction books can turn a dry subject into a gripping adventure story or a captivating time in someone's life or, peek, or a peek into a creature's unknown wilderness. New Zealand has some very talented authors writing in this genre. David Hill, Raymond Huber, and Jennifer Beck to name a few, and there are many more who have recently come to this newish genre. It's so new librarians are still unsure where to place them, with the picture books or with the non-fiction books. Same happens at the Book Awards, if only it had its own category. There have also been some that could, could appear in the novel category, Susan Brocker's standalone animal books, Joanna Groshewitz's historical series, and others. I'm writing one at the moment for my AUT Masters in Creative Writing thesis. From when I first started writing expository to biographies, then creative nonfiction picture books, to now creating a creative nonfiction novel, my writing has changed along with the styles. When I was writing Bird's Eye View, I paired my writing back, facts told as they were. I didn't dress them with description or imagery. The designer displayed the informational text in a text box or with subheadings. In biography books such as Anzac Animals, I pick the most prominent moments in a person's life and chronologically tell their life story. Text boxes and timelines highlight the climatic moments. In creative nonfiction picture books, I've reduced the events to the highlights and then add thoughts, dialogue, action and description so I'm showing, not telling the story. Author Lorraine Orman has mentored me in this style of writing, telling me where I need to show more of the character's soul or some insight into what they're feeling in the story. I've discovered in my master's course that when you write a chapter book, you have even more room to elaborate on those devices. In creative nonfiction novels, you can also include backflashes, memory recounts, and cliffhangers like you would in a fictional novel. 
Now, some of you might wonder, why haven't I just written fiction since I enjoy using these techniques in creative nonfiction books? And I guess it all comes back to my background. I grew up as the eldest of three children, living in Auckland for the first 13 years of my life, shifting often because my father liked to renovate old houses and sell them. When he managed an ice rink, normal suburban life went out the door. For the next three years, we spent most of our life in an icy building, watching long-haired teenagers racing around the rink, and we all became ice skaters, competing in Auckland and national competitions. We didn't watch TV. We ate our dinner at the rink, played pool, and came home when it was bedtime with mum, while dad stayed at the rink working until midnight. This experience gave me an interest in sports psychology. I knew the only thing holding me back in competitions was my lack of confidence in myself, and that's why I wanted to write a sport book that gave kids tips on how to further their sporting techniques much later. After one stormy separation and makeup afterwards, we moved over to Brisbane, Australia to start afresh. We lived in a small caravan and traveled for two years around New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, driving mostly in the outbacks, fossicking for stones, fishing in freshwater creeks, swimming and biking around caravan parks. We met many unusual characters, found ourselves in a few hot spots sometimes, and carried on being the dysfunctional family we were. Still no television or radio or even books to entertain us. Adventures on our bikes and observing nature kept up our interest. The only way I could socially distance myself was to throw myself into my correspondence studies. My parents gave up trying to coerce my brother and sister into doing their schoolwork. It was living amongst the wild wilderness, making our own fun and letting our imaginations go wild that gave me an interest in writing about New Zealand's natives and how we could save them. I believe if we can give kids the tools to help endangered animals, they'll feel more empowered to do something about it. When I left school, I traveled for three years, mostly by myself. I was a nanny in Greece, a shepherd and grape picker in Israel and a barmaid in England. All the travel and work experiences gave me an interest in how people tick. That led to writing biography books with the underlying message in these stories to give it your best shot, pick yourself up after a disappointment or setback and strive for your dreams. When I came back to New Zealand, I knew my heart wasn't in working in an office anymore. I felt trapped within its four walls. I went back to school, university, teacher's college, and then another degree completed extramurally while my children were babies. I loved it. Surprisingly, I didn't love teaching. I enjoyed the creative side of it, devising interesting lessons, reading aloud to kids and growing their young minds. I didn't like dealing with parents and naughty children. I left to be a stay at home mother and write on a lifestyle block with lots of animals. I also became involved with releasing a three, three week old Kiwis on Motorua, Motorua Island for eight years, educating the public about the Operation Nest Egg program. That was 18 years ago, and since then I've had the privilege to write one to three books a year, 60 books in total. It hasn't been just about the writing for me. It was also being part of a community of writers and illustrators. Early in my writing career, I joined Storylines and New Zealand Society of Authors, then started up Kiwi Write for Kids. I felt there was a gap for people who wanted to write for children. When the group started, only Kathy White and Claire Scott had, had books published. We organised author talks, workshops and conferences with seasoned writers and illustrators and wrote a monthly newsletter keeping everyone up to date with what was happening in the industry. I was lucky to have a great management team, Heather Arnold, Melinda Shamanek, Jean Pryor and others who helped with the organising. Our very first speaker was Jennifer Beck. We drove out to her house in South Auckland and she served us cake and tea. That was when the group was small. And afterwards, Jennifer kept in touch to see how we were going. We grew to 100 mem members. We also had Brian Faulkner talk to us several times, sharing the secrets of his very successful career, along with other wonderful writers like David Hill, Ken Catran, Barbara Ouse, and illustrators like Sandra Morris, Gavin Bishop, and David Elliott. We even organized a weekend workshop with one of Australia's most successful authors, John Marsden. One of the lovely stories from that weekend was that a 14-year-old boy asked, begged, if he could come on the workshop. 
His mother assured us he was a keen writer and wouldn't be any trouble. That 14-year-old boy had already written a novel and rewritten it several times. He kept in touch with John Marsden and me over the years. I learned later that he sent letters to famous writers in Australia and New Zealand, guaranteeing that he'd be a writer one day. When he turned 23, he self-published his novel, which he had rewritten nine times by then. He's now up to book six in his series. There were heaps of success stories over the 13 years that Kiwi Write for Kids ran, from only two published authors to 75% of the group being published. In fact, I remember two years after our first course, sitting in a cafe in Aotea Square after a Storylines Family Festival day and saying, just think, it could be us one day, giving one of those talks about our books. We grinned, crossed our fingers. It seemed an impossible dream, even an audacious one. We were so full of doubt, and it seemed such a difficult industry to break into. One year later, two of us had stories accepted, and the rest of the group followed. Over the years, I've visit visited a lot of schools through speakers agencies such as Read New Zealand, Speakers Inc. in Australia, Storylines, Duffy Books, and also privately. Even though I'd been a teacher, I was nervous about giving talk talks at first. My goal was to inform. I quickly learned that being entertaining was just as important. From experts like Brian Faulkner, Fifi Colston, and Des Hunt, I, through them, I learned to make my talks interactive. When giving author talks, I start with showing students a picture of myself at 12 years of age. I'm about to start my free figure skating program in the Auckland Junior Figure Skating Competition. I was not a confident teenager, but I had practice before and after school and every day in the weekend. I tell kids that I believe everyone can achieve their dream if they practice hard for it. And my dream that day was to place in that competition. I thought my chances were slim. I was competing against two girls who had skated since they were toddlers. One was from England, the other from Canada. I'd only been skating for several years. I practiced every day and had the attitude of not giving up. I was determined not to win so much, but to do my best. I tell kids, I think I was more surprised than everyone that day when I won that competition. That's when I turn to kids and say, if you practice, don't give up and try your best, you can achieve your dreams too. Our job as writers in schools is to inspire kids to love reading and writing but we can inspire them in other ways too. I then segue into the grown up me saying, back then I knew I wanted to be a writer one day. The week we left to go to Australia, we visited family friends and they urged me to sign their friendship book. 13 year old me wrote, I want to be a writer one day. I didn't know how I'd achieve it. It was just something I kept in the back of my mind as I was growing up. I always read lots of books, and wrote lots of letters and stories. It wasn't until I had children of my own that I put that dream into practice. Like the ice skating, I practice a lot and write every day. I don't give up, even though it is a difficult industry. And I give it my best shot, always editing my work. When writing nonfiction books, I spend a lot of time researching. I've been fortunate enough to receive a couple of Creative New Zealand grants that enabled me to travel to Australia to visit the Australian War Museum in Canberra while writing Anzac Heroes and Anzac Animals. Because of my strong connection with Australia, I wanted to include Australian men and women and animals in the books too. Sometimes I must put my investigator hat on and delve deep for stories. For example, in Anzac Heroes, I wanted to include two Aboriginal soldiers. I couldn't find any information online or in books about Lance Corporal Albert Knight, who won a DCM medal. I resorted to the phone book and rang all the Knights in Bourke, New South Wales. On the sixth phone call, I found a relative. He gave me several other people's phone numbers, and between them, I was able to tell Albert's life story. A wonderful outcome after talking to an RSL representative and putting him in touch with Albert's relatives resulted in a long overdue headstone and plaque being put on Albert's grave in 2015. Often the stories that are the hardest to get are the most rewarding. The book took eight months to write, working seven days a week. We all put a lot of work into making it the award-winning book it is, and it's been my most successful book. Some people might think, 
We writers sit in our PJs all day and we write when the muse hits us. And it couldn't be further than the truth. The authors that keep getting published year after year are most likely the ones that work seven days a week on their stories, working past midnight to hit deadlines and having to factor in daily exercise to ward off RSI and the risks from using the keyboard too much or backaches and blood clotting issues from sitting in a chair all day and headaches and insomnia from looking at a computer screen too long. But that might only apply to the workaholics in the industry. And I confess, I'm one of those. And it doesn't include the mental issues when our stories are rejected, when we're not shortlisted, a grant is denied, we get a bad review, or ignored by influencers, festival organisers, etc. Over time, we learn to shake off those dis disappointments and carry on and be proactive at organising events, school visits, workshops, etc. Of course, there are lots of fabulous moments too, where our own boss when we are at home tapping away on our computers. We work the hours when we want. We get to travel the country and for some overseas, talking to children about our books. We meet and interview interesting people, research subjects we're fascinated in or didn't know much about before, and we produce beautiful books. Kids listen to our talks with rapture and some kids come rushing up and hug you afterwards because they've enjoyed your talk so much. Though one time, I had been talking to a group of high school students and they watched with deadpan faces throughout the talk. And I thought, well, I failed to engage this audience. Then afterwards, a group of girls came up and told me it was an awesome talk. So you don't always know. <laughs> Most of my income comes from, my, from giving author talks and workshops in schools. Duffy Books has taken me on dirt roads to small schools with only eight kids in Middle Earth to large schools in the far north, places I might never have visited. These schools really have visitors, let alone authors visiting, and they've been a joy. When giving author talks, instead of reading my stories aloud, I tend to get a group of kids up and give them masks, and we act out my The Last of, my, of Maori Dolphins book, or I give them puppets, and I read aloud while I stand very shyly holding a puppet. I scoured shops all over the world online to get every predator so we could act out the Operation Nest Egg Chick book. And I've rewritten several pages from Kate Shepard, Abel Tasman and Icebreaker into readers' theatre scripts so kids can read aloud the story in front of their class with me. I also take a lot of props, props with me, from a three-metre picture of an albatross to a model of the Parliament House, a cardboard model of the hem skirt from Abel Tasman book, etc. During the school visits, I've been asked the darndest things. The cutest so far was one little girl, who looks a little bit like this picture, with her hair tied in tight plaits, who shyly sidled up to me when I was packing up and said, did you brush your hair today? I assured her I had. She looked at my wild mane, frizzier than normal because of the wind outside, and gave me a look that she was very sceptical that I had done so. In schools, I invariably get asked my age, and I remember one time I had just turned a new decade, so I was a bit sensitive about my new golden age, and a kid at the back of the hall asked how old I was. We generally get asked most talks, and I answered, very old, but he wasn't satisfied with that answer. I should have done what Kyle Newbin does and shout, I'm 100 years old! The young boy waited until everyone had filed out of the hall, came up and asked me again. I tried to fob him off with another glib answer, but he wasn't having that. I could tell he wasn't going to leave until I told him the truth. Half a century, I said. His mouth dropped open. That's really old in kid time. Happy he had his answer, he ran off to join his class. I ask questions too and get surprise answers. After my book, New Zealand Hall of Fame came out, I asked the audience, what would you like to be when you grow up? Half the room put their hands up. It was an all black, silver fern. But once one kid answered, I want to lie on the couch and watch TV all day. I didn't know what to say to that. <laughs> As a full-time author, I need to spend a lot of time getting my books in front of my target audience. In the past, I've talked at libraries, signed books at bookstores and attended events. I'm a teacher on Write Like an Author Camps. Ryan Faulkner founded and wrote the one to three day workshops. It's the most comprehensive writing course I've ever come across and the kids love it. It's also fun. We play story sports, but like theater sports, 
reverse charades using book titles, and covers and lines where kids guess the name of the book from the back blank cover or opening sentence. And they also do role plays. I've also organized a lot of literary events to help other authors and myself promote our books. We used to get crowds up to 100 to these events. Over the last few years, it's dropped to 20 people, and we've even had audiences as low as three. What's changed over those years? Teachers and librarians are busier, have smaller budgets, and dare I say it, people are reading less. Also, if I ask kids what their favourite book or author is, most will name an international author or book. It's very disheartening for New Zealand authors, and I've tried to address it in several ways. Early on, I realized we needed to have more of an online presence. Children's books were really being re reviewed in newspapers and magazines. I started up the Kids Book NZ blog with Lorraine Orman, who 12 years later is still one of the main con contributors. Other authors have come on board, including Melinda Shamanic, Michelle Powles, Vanessa Hatley Owen, Claire Scott, and Bryn Murray. We've had nearly 500,000 page views over the years, and it's now on Facebook and Twitter, helping to grow the audience of people interested in New Zealand children's books. I've also organised displays in New Zealand and Australian libraries. I held the first two New Zealand exhibitions at the National Library. And the third one travelled around libraries all around the country. Libra libraries packed it up at the end of the month and sent it to the next library. On the display boards, authors and illustrators showed what the research process was for their book. I took two of these books over to Australia and had a meeting with the Brisbane Central Librarian. They were keen to do something similar. They had a budget to pay designers to design the boards and we printed them on foam boards. They displayed the ANZAC theme boards around Brisbane libraries over a two year period. I sent the PDF files to other libraries around Australia and they printed them off and displayed them in their libraries. They were displayed in libraries as far away as Broome, Adelaide, Canberra and Tasmania. And we had authors such as Jackie French, Anthony Hill, Sally Murphy, Diana Wolfer, Claire Saxby and others, including New Zealand authors and illustrators, Melinda Shamanic, Glenn Harper and Jenny Cooper, David Hill and Fifi Colston, and Marco and Ivanchik and I took part in this exhibition. For both exhibitions, I wrote a blog, included biographies, reviews, teaching resources and interviews, and they're still available online if librarians and teachers want to access them. It would be great if our Aussie cousins and New Zealand authors and illustrators could co cooperate on more projects like this. Trans-Tasman marketing would give us a more even platform against the hundreds of American and English titles that invade our bookstores every year. Those international publishers mass produce their books and therefore have more money to spend on marketing. So when you walk into a bookstore, the first thing you'll see are stand-up cardboard displays of David Williams' books, David Pilkey's books, and other international children's books. This has been a problem ever since I started writing and has only become more so over the years. But now we also compete with puzzles, children's toys, and fancy stationery. Thank goodness for the Dorothy Butler Bookshop, Children's Bookshop in Wellington, Books for Kids in Hamilton, and other like-minded bookstores that support New Zealand books and their authors and illustrators. And so I take this opportunity today to encourage you all, and I know I'm talking to the converted here, to read more New Zealand books. Make displays in your classrooms, school and public libraries of the latest New Zealand books. Read them aloud to your students. Use them in your high school English studies. Invite New Zealand authors and illustrators to give a paid talk or workshop at your school or library. And download the excellent teacher resource publishers have written for these books. We have so many gifted authors and illustrators in New Zealand. Let's not look over their shoulders to the international authors and books all the time. Even though we've just come out of lockdown, authors and illustrators have been busy producing new books. During that time, I rewrote the pandemic section of my disaster book. I started that book a week before the mosque massacre. It was being illustrated when White Island volcano erupted, edited when the bushfires in Australia were raging and designed when the pandemic started. Now, I don't think of the book as being jinxed, more a sign of the times. 
With this book, we've recorded the very latest disasters in real time. After the pandemic, Scholastic delayed its release six months when we're hopefully returned to more a more normal normal. I've rewritten the pandemic chapter several times. Hopefully we won't have any more lockdown scenarios. New Zealand disasters, our response, resilience and recovery comes out in February, complemented with Marco Vanjic's realistic illustrations. We didn't want a doom and gloom book though. Instead, we've put a positive slant on the subject. I've written creative nonfiction stories about the disasters, what we've learned from them and who the amazing people are that get us through this difficult time and what kids can do to help themselves recover after a disaster. Disaster books always need updating and schools study disasters at least every two years. During the pandemic, I also emailed people I had interviewed for a true animal tales book I've written, asking for photographs. Illustrator Emma Huya Lovegrove is drawing the animals at pictures and you can get a sneak peek there. Scholastic intends releasing it in June 2021. It includes gorgeous stories, for example, a Burmese cat that competes in a dog swimming competition, a 12 year old girl who's a koala whisperer, a lonely gannet, an unlucky in love albatross, a talkative korkako, and other funny, true animal stories. I've loved writing these stories and can't wait to share them with you. Other author and illustrator friends also have exciting new books coming out, so look out for them too. Now, it might be harder to get published today, but if you persevere and work hard, it is possible to get published in today's tricky times. If you want to write and get published, I suggest you attend workshops. There are plenty offered online at present. Go to conferences and write and read every day. I've been writing for 18 years, but still consider myself a learner. This year, I've participated in two online workshops and a master's in creative writing degree at AUT. I've been very lucky to have author, lecturer, James George as my tutor, and I've enjoyed meeting the other talented writers on the course and the lecturers too. We're collating short stories and poems and producing an anthology due for release in December this year. Finally, what I've learned over the years is that writers are not an island on an island typing their stories. We're part of a vibrant community of writers, illustrators, publishers, designers, booksellers, librarians, reviewers, educators, and readers. The germ of an idea might start with an author, but it takes a village to make a book and a community to get a scene in the wider world. But writers and illustrators can't sit back and wait for everyone to come to them. We need to be proactive in getting our New Zealand books to our target audiences. That might mean participating in social media, writing a blog, reviewing books, becoming part of the storylines in New Zealand Society of Authors team, or holding events. And it might also mean donning a crazy hat, a t-shirt blazoned with your book cover, or a costume to bring your books alive to a target audience. We're not just writers and illustrators, we're also presenters, and kids like a bit of flair. If you're a writer or, or illustrator, I wish you all the best with your journey. It's a roller coaster ride full of joy, learning, and ups and downs. And for all the readers out there, enjoy your next New Zealand book. It's due to your support that books keep getting published in this country. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Here's the lovely medallion, which is sailing past our view. Hello uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Bridget Mahi, and uh, thank you for your wonderful lecture, Maria. We live in strange times, and I wonder how the future will look back on this period. One distinctive thing for me is noticing that New Zealand can unite for the greater good. And then I wonder, what would a children's book look like, um, Maria, if it's about a pandemic? Hmm. Maria is a writer who helps children to get to know their country, their past, and their present. An author who covers subjects, including geography, the environment, science, social science, and history. 
Maria has become a hugely valuable resource for educating our children. When our children are awash in imagery sourced from American media, it is comforting to know that they are being exposed to the work of a dedicated and skilled local writer who enlightens and entertains them about our natural environments, historical fighters, voyagers, and risk takers. Maria's diversity of topics is a strength and places her at the hub of a community of like-minded people, curious people, driven to support children in their nascent identification as Kiwis. What a cool place to be. Uh, like Maria, when Margaret worked full-time as a writer, one of her great joys was to connect with children, but also to work with and within a community of creative and passionate adults, feeding children's imaginations through word, idea, fact and image, and even performance. What writers will do to entertain. The notion that good non-fiction has a lot of fiction in it contains an essential truth that Maria is exploring. Maria talked about building her confidence over time to add further storytelling flair to her words. She found ways to emotionally involve the reader and develop insights into how a persona is feeling in the moment. Clearly, this is Maria's future, exploring ways to open up nonfiction to new creative possibilities. Who knows where Maria will take herself next? Congratulations, Maria girl. 2020 storylines, Margaret Mahi, woohoo, medal winner. Whoop, whoop. And thank you for watching.